you want to take your Bibles out and turn to the Gospel of Luke today, it's a short parable, but it's packed with lots of meaning. We're going to look at it today. Luke 12, we're going to start at verse 35. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. And that's where we'll stop. It says there, be dressed and ready for service. There's um, some old language there that that's referring to. It's called, gird your loins. Does that mean anything to anybody? Gird your loins. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, just a few. Okay, so then it's probably good to kind of describe what that means here. I had to look it up myself just to make sure, and I found a couple different descriptions of what gird your loins actually means. So back then, people were in these togas, right? And they'd be something like this. They'd pro- they, they wouldn't be like this necessarily. They'd be attached around like so. Well, gird your loins. It means you have a belt on like this. And back then, to gird your loins meant that you were ready to serve. So in this case here, when you're in this baggy outfit here, you want that because you're in a desert climate, it's really hot and dry, and so you want this loose-fitting clothing because it's a little less hot out, right? You don't want stuff nice and tight and everything. So... But it's not very good for moving around or or serving or bending over or other things like that. It's just not very good for that. So to gird your loins is to do something like this. Something like that. So now, if I needed to bend over or run or whatever, my legs are a little more free that I can actually do what needs to be done. So, be dressed, ready for service. That's what that's talking about. If you hear the phrase, gird your loins, it's, it's something like this. I'm, I'm not an expert at girding loins, but this is, uh, this is something about what it would look like anyways. So I just wanted to... Uh, show you what that meant. Be ready for service. Be ready for service. It says, stay dressed and ready for service because they were expecting their master to return. They're expecting their master to return. If you have your Bible with you today, I want you to get something to write with here. Above the word in uh, verse, that first, um, uh, let's see, verse 36 there. Above the word waiting, write expecting. Want to make a star or circle it or something like that? Write expecting. And above the word return, write break loose. Okay, if um, you have an ESV, it would say come, come home instead of return, but right break loose there. 
Now, let's read it again. Like men expecting their master to break loose from a wedding banquet. Expecting their master to break loose from a wedding banquet. Does that change it just a little bit? That's kind of, that's kind of a little bit more of what's going on here. They're not just sitting around bored waiting for their master to come home. They're waiting expectantly for the master to be able to break away from a wedding banquet. The servants are expecting the master to break loose. They're not sitting around. They're not bored. They're expecting him to come at any time. And the master, he's not just returning. He's breaking away from a party, a wedding party that he is a part of. Now, this kind of This kind of changes the situation. Why would you want to break away from a wedding party, like a wedding reception? Their receptions lasted for days, by the way, not just one evening. So why would why would a master be trying to get away from that? What what's going on here? It's kind of odd to be breaking away from a wedding banquet. Something else that's odd here that we might not pick up on, or at least I didn't is that it says it's nighttime. It says keep your lamps burning so it's dark out. It says the master knocks. Strangely, the master is knocking at nighttime. Okay, now if it's nighttime, we still knock on each other's doors. That's normal. But in the Middle East, even to this day, apparently from what I read, only strangers knock on doors at night. A knock will frighten a sleeping friend while a recognizable voice calling, Hey Joe, it's me, open the door, will assure those in the house that no foul play is afoot. So the house owner will quickly open the door. So if you are going to a friend's house, somebody who knows you, you might knock, but you will also call out, Hey, it's me. Could you open the door? And then they'll be, oh, okay, I know you. I can open the door. You're a safe person. But when it's dark out, especially when there's not a lot of street lights or other things like that, there's a lot of opportunity for robbers and thieves. And so it's dangerous to open the door at night. So that master knocking at night, that's a little odd. If you... They'll go to another parable. There's a bold friend at midnight. He doesn't knock. He calls to his neighbor to help him. In Revelation 3.20, you've probably seen the picture of Jesus standing by this door and knocking on it. That is referring to Revelation 3 verse 20, where Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock, but it doesn't stop there. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So Jesus isn't just knocking, he's calling out, hey, it's me, could you open the door? That's how they did things back there. So typically you open the door to a familiar voice, not just a random knock. But this time the master is just knocking. So that kind of says something about what's going on here a little bit. The master doesn't call because he's near the festivities and doesn't want to announce his absence. That's the most likely thing of what's going on here. The door here would probably be an inside door that's safe to open at night. You're not opening to the outside darkness where anybody could be out there. You're opening an inside door where you know who's inside. And their servants... These servants, they know their master is coming, and so when there is this knock, they know who it is. It's almost like a prearranged plan. All right, I'm going to just, I'm going to knock three times, or four, or whatever, and then you'll know it's me. It seems to be what's going on. They're not asleep because if he's just knocking, they might not hear that. So they're still waiting expectantly for him to come. 
but he's not going to use his voice because apparently he's close to the festivities and doesn't want to announce his absence. That would be kind of dishonoring to the hosts. In verse 37, it calls these men servants. Let's be honest here. Servants is just a nice translation for slaves. Back then, slavery was very common. There were a lot of people who were slavery. And slaves mean that you were at the bottom of a totem pole. There is nobody below you. It goes master, then the mistress and the children, the steward, the foreman, the hired staff, the day laborers, and then the slaves. So, these people are not just any people. They are, these are people at the bottom of the totem pole. These are people who, according to the culture at the time, are insignificant, are basically only good for just some basic tasks, and they're kind of like the equivalent of animals. That's what the culture said at the time. These people are barely worth recognizing, barely worth acknowledging, and they're just people to use as pawns in your day-to-day operations. Give them the stuff that you don't want to do, the, the jobs that nobody else wants to do. Those are slaves. But these slaves, these slaves are not just slaves. These slaves are already blessed and happy, it says. Where it says in the NIV there, it will be good for, I'd probably be better translated, happy are. It's not that these slaves have to do something in order to earn their master's favor. They're already happy. They're already blessed. So if you want to write happy R above it will be good for, go for it. Some translations actually make that, or translate it that way anyways. Before opening the door, these slaves are already blessed. They're expectantly opening the door because of who they are already. They're not trying to earn something. They're already blessed. It's not an attempt to earn what they don't have. This is an expression of who they are. They're expectantly waiting to open that door, waiting for that knock. And they are blessed and happy because they have a master unlike any other master. They're blessed and happy because they have a master of this kind. Servants serve masters but this master serves servants. This master would have been a great master if he would have even just sent somebody else to do it, to to serve these slaves. If he would have picked somebody else in that totem pole there, could you go take care of the slaves and give them something to eat? He would have been an outstanding master. Slaves would have loved to serve somebody like that. That's incredible. Masters don't usually consider what's best for their slaves. Especially in the ancient world. This never happens. A master serving servants? That's unthinkable. That never happens. A few philosophers, a few eggheads um, in the ivory tower argued that slaves were moral equals of their masters. And there's one well-to-do Roman who is known to have eaten on the same level as his freed slaves. Not the regular slaves, the freed ones. But masters serving slaves is unheard of. There is no record of anything like that ever happening at all. The master's acts represent a stunning reversal of roles. This is somebody who who lived in the Middle East for many years. I know of no incident in contemporary life 
or in story out of the past in the Middle East where such an incredible reversal of status appears. This is, this is incredible. This never happens. This is unthinkable, especially in an honor-shame culture. All right, we don't live in, in that much of an honor-shame culture, but in that day and time, respect was everything that you wanted out of life. You would rather die with honor than live with dishonor. And so that means if you were at the top of the totem pole, you acted like you were at the top of that totem pole. You never would gird your loins like I just did over there. You would never do that. That's dishonorable. Masters don't gird their loins. That's for everybody else to do. That's not very masterly. So this, this master serving servants, this is, this is, this doesn't compute. That doesn't make sense. This is so unthinkable that Jesus prefaces it here with, I tell you the truth. Seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest, for real, not playing around. I tell you the truth. This is a rare phrase in Luke. In John, it's all over the place. It's like 26 times. In Luke, it's only nine, even though Luke is much longer. So Luke saves this phrase here to really drive this point home. This is really the case. This is how it works. For real. Not playing around. Not joking. This is how it is. The master himself girds his loins to serve. This is very undignified for a master. And even though today it's not an honor-shame culture, it's still pretty remarkable when you see a reversal of roles like this. It's very exceptional to see a CEO on an assembly line, isn't it? That almost never happens. Or how about a president cleaning a toilet? You probably wouldn't see that. Or a foreman doing heavy lifting? That usually doesn't happen. You usually assign somebody to do that. Or a restaurant owner waiting tables? Not how it works. You have people to do that. Your time is better spent elsewhere. So you have these roles, and you stay in these roles. I still remember, um, still remember one time, I think it was on the Today Show, where President George W. Bush, there was a, a house being built, and he himself was hammering nails in with a bunch of other people. And I still have that image in my mind. Here's the President of the United States. Hammering nails in on a house for somebody. You don't see that very often. And just this week, I was going through, uh, going through some news items and I saw this little clip of Mike Pence. And he was clearing branches from this area that's been afflicted by the hurricane. He was just, he was pulling branches around, trying to, clear things up. And that, that image was very powerful. Wow! The vice president of all people is doing something that pretty much anybody can do. Somebody who's up here doing work that's down here, that's it's still something that opens your eyes. So there's a point to be learned here for all of us. There is eternal value in menial work that blesses others. There's there's eternal value in that. This is not just being nice to people. It's not just something that's a good thing to do. It's not just for your own... There's eternal value in this. There's something cosmic and heavenly about doing something that's beneath you to help somebody else. I still remember I was I uh, bagged groceries for a 
a couple of years when I was in high school. And part of the bagger's job at the end of the day was that you had to clean up in the area where there was the bakery and the deli. And so you had to clean all the floors and wipe down some counters and, and things like that. And it was not a pleasant job because in the bakery, there's all kinds of junk that, that gets dropped on the floor and same with the deli. So I had to scrape this stuff off and I had to sweep it and I had to mop it and it was not very pleasant, but that's what you had to do. Well, one time I was assigned to go clean the meat department because I knew how and the person who normally did that wasn't around. So I was pulled off cleaning the deli in the bakery to go clean the meat department. So I was there and, and uh, I was working and there was one time I was walking back and the person who got assigned to take my spot cleaning the bakery in the deli was normally a stalker. That's, a little, that's one step up from being a, a bag boy. Right? So now he's doing stuff that only a bag boy does. And I heard from everybody else, he was crying and complaining. Well, not crying, but he was complaining and belly aching and moaning about, this isn't worth my five bucks an hour. I don't know what this is about. He was just going on and on and on about how terrible this was. And I was thinking to myself, okay, you make five bucks an hour? I only make... 450 an hour. And 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 this is this is too difficult for you to do. But he had been moved down a peg. And that's what he was complaining about. There's also monetary value in menial work. But that's not what this is. You can pay somebody to clean your toilets and your floors and all that kind of stuff. But that's not the same, because this master was not paid to do this. This is not how he makes money. So this is different. What this is, is also it's not expected or demanded of the master. Slaves don't expect this from their master. They don't demand this from their master. So this is different. When you do something that's beneath you, voluntarily, on your own, by your own choice, not because you're expected to, not because you're demanded to, not because you're paid to, but just because you want to help somebody else, it serves somebody else, that's what this is. That's pretty incredible. We will do a lot of things if we're expected to or if we're paid to Doing something like this just out of the goodness of your heart, that's pretty remarkable. But people, we have a heavenly master who serves. We have a heavenly master who serves like this. Jesus is a little bit painting a picture of himself because Jesus, being the Son of God, did not just sit high in his heavenly throne for eternity he became one of us. Emmanuel is God with us, right? He came to be one of us, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness, and not only stopping there, he even took our punishment. Even death on a cross. And it doesn't even stop there. When all things are made new, when he comes again and the there's a new heaven and a new earth. It says that he is going to share his privileges with us. Not because he's paid to. Not because he's going to get something out of it. Not because it's expected of him. Not because we manipulated him into doing it. Because he loves us. That's it. He loves us. If you are shopping around in other religions out there, there's plenty of them. If you look around, you will find that there's a lot of gods that we must serve and that in serving them you earn points and you win favor. In the world religions out there, it's basically about do. Do this, do that, earn this, earn that. With Christ, 
It's done. He did it already. It's done. He loves us. We have a God who serves us. That's incredible. I hope that doesn't wear out its awesome nature for you. In the parable here, the master brings food. We, we know here that there's a wedding. We know it was an inside door, that it was a safe door there. And it says that he's going to have them recline at the table. These servants are going to recline. That means that they're going to eat a meal. You reclined at the table. You, you laid down on your side with your head on your hand like this, and you ate with this hand here. So that means that he's going to serve them food. Now, it doesn't talk about any food being prepared or anything. It's not like, okay, I'm going to make you guys a little something here while, while I'm enjoying the wedding. The master brings food, and he serves himself. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper next week. This is kind of what's going on here. In the Lord's Supper, Christ Himself serves and He serves Himself. He is the one who is the host at the table. Let's not forget this. When I'm up at this table and I'm handing the elements to the elders for them to distribute to all of you, I am not the host. Christ is the host of this table, of this meal. He is hosting all of us, including me. I am just handing it off. And the food that we eat is not bread and juice. He is serving us himself. We call it a sacrament because it is a sacred thing. This is not just to jog our memories. There is something very significant going on here that the Holy Spirit is doing that we don't fully understand. But Christ is serving us Himself. He did say, this is my body. Take it and eat it. That's that's pretty significant. He serves us Himself. Look at uh, the screen here. Why then does Christ call the bread His body and the cup his blood, or the new covenant in his blood. Paul uses the words, a participation in Christ's body and blood. Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that as bread and wine nourish our temporal life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood truly nourish our souls for eternal life. But more important, he wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance and that all of his suffering and obedience are as definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. You notice that it says we share in His true body and blood as surely as we are taking this unto ourselves. In the story here, it's kind of open-ended on what the servants eat, but it's not too much of a stretch to know what they are going to be eating. In the story here, the Master presumably serves them wedding food. The food that he is enjoying. The food that all of the other guests are enjoying. The food that these slaves are not privileged to be able to eat. This is the best food. This is wedding food. You bring out your best food for a wedding. This is a big deal. It's food that they are not entitled to. This is the master's food. This is food that he's entitled to. He's one of the honored guests. They are not one of these guests, but he is taking what is his, properly his, and serving them with it. So these slaves are getting food 
that only belongs really to the master and all of these other honored guests. In Isaiah 25, it says this, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. The rest of that passage you're going to read this week in your Bible readings. This is a kind of a picture of heaven here. And this, is, this parable also is a picture of heaven here too. Because in reality, when Christ returns, He will share His own privileges with His people. He's not going to, when all is said and done, He's not going to just be sitting up on this throne and we're not just going to be all beneath Him all the time. It says we are going to reign with Him. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. This is on the screen. If we died with Him, we will also live with Him. We share that privilege. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. We, we get to share His privileges. Romans eight seventeen. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Our Lord just gives and gives and gives and gives. There's no end to His giving. And He's not just giving us good things, He's giving us the, the stuff of heavenly eternal value that is only properly His, and He's giving it to us. He's going to share that with us. When you're kids and you have to share your toys with, with other kids, that's kind of a bummer, isn't it? God is sharing His own toys with us. Even though they're toys that we could never afford in a million years. So, for us, to be like Christ means to be a servant. If you want to be like Christ, then you better be willing to serve other people. Being willing to go down a peg and do that kind of work. The work that you are maybe too good to do. Jesus said after he washed his disciples' feet, that's your Bible reading track for today, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, that's the slave's job. Your Lord and teacher just did the slave's job of washing your feet, so also you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. This is what we're called to. We're called to serve. We're called to go down that totem pole, not up. And we're called to do work that we might otherwise not do. If we call ourselves Christians, then we need to be known for our service. If you ask around, Christians are mostly known for being kind of arrogant, being kind of forceful with their opinions, kind of looking down on other people, judgmental a little bit, kind of stuck on themselves maybe. Let's be known for our service. Let's be known for going down the totem pole. Let's be known for doing work that we are not going to get paid for, that we are not expected to do, and that we are not going to get anything out of at all purely out of the goodness of our heart, out of the love that Christ has shown us. That's, let's be known for that. So this means service of the lowest kind. Kind that's otherwise beneath us. The kind that you have to otherwise use force or money to get people to do. Let's do that work. And this means service that is freely offered. There's a lot of things that we are expected to do. There's a lot of things that we are demanded to do. And sometimes if, sometimes if somebody's just expecting us to do something nice, sometimes it's maybe good to say, you know what? I, I don't think I'm going to do that. Because if people are just expecting us to do something that we aren't supposed to do, maybe, maybe there needs to be some boundaries there or something. Not that it's not good to do, but sometimes we do need to draw boundaries with our lives. Otherwise, people will just take and take and take. 
but to do something that is freely offered that you are not going to get paid for, that you are not going to get any personal benefit from at all, this is the kind of work that Christ calls us to do. Voluntary. As blessed servants, we expect His return by serving as He does, as He serves. So, our challenge is to gird your loins. Gird your loins. Be ready to serve. And serve in ways that are otherwise beneath you that you are not going to get any personal benefit out of. Just simply because you love like Christ has loved us. Let's bow our heads. Lord our God in heaven, it's amazing that you would serve us in the ways in which you do. We pray that we would always take that to heart and remember how much you lowered yourself and how much you suffered so that we would be blessed. Help us to have that same love for one another and for others so that, Lord, more people would know who you are and realize how much you do love us. And Lord, put that on our hearts this week. In Jesus' name, amen.